my name is Oliver Dykstra. I work for the Texas Rangers uh, baseball club. Because they won the World Series last year, uh, I have the joy of saying something I never thought I'd ever say before, but I am the current reigning world champion data engineer. <laughs> for at least another month. Uh, if we gotta, we got to pull out some miracles uh, to keep that title. But uh, Any baseball fans in the house? All right, we got a few, we got a few. That's okay, that's okay. We'll catch uh, the rest of you up to speed a little bit. A uh, little history of baseball statistics, uh, look at the, what the modern uh, state of big data baseball is. So then we'll talk about uh, how Airflow helped us win that World Series and, uh, and what it all looked like. So modern baseball is over 150 years old. Uh, and we started collecting statistics on that right away. Uh, it was basic stuff, hits, runs, outs. It started being put into newspapers right out the gate. Uh, and I still have tables with all of these games. Uh, it was about 100 years later, it started to be really popular, popularized. And you'd see those uh, box scores on the back of baseball cards. And uh, later into the, uh, into the century, uh, there started to be publications that really took deep dives into baseball statistics. Uh, we, we saw some uh, homegrown operations. RetroSheet was amazing. One guy's passion turned to an, into an army of volunteers who were collecting uh, statistics from you know, games, ancient games played way back in the 1850s. And they would go through newspaper articles, sometimes contradicting, you know, you'd get different uh, data points from different places, a uh, story I'm sure we're all familiar with. But really, um, uh, big point here, it was uh, ran by volunteers. Baseball has always had uh, uh, passionate people contributing uh, in much uh, what, I, what I akin to an open source uh, philosophy. Uh, another publication, Baseball Prospectus, started sending uh, higher level statistics into front offices and really started changing the way coaches um, and the front office started to value players, which of course led to, uh, right across the bay, the Oakland A's uh, and their Moneyball experience. Um, in, in this movie, I'm not Brad Pitt, I'm not Jonah Hill, uh, I'm not. Uh, my role is, is not even invented yet, because these guys were uh, uh, on spreadsheets, you know. Um, but what they did was something really interesting, right? They took the data that was available and found a new way to look at it. Uh, before that, the way hitters were valued uh, was purely by the number of hits they got and how that contributed to runs scored. The big breakthrough point was that if you include all of the ways that they get on base, whether they are walked or even if they're hit by pitches, you know, they get more scores. You, know, you get more people on base, you win more games. Uh, they found a market inefficiency. Uh, they use data-driven dis decisions to completely disrupt the industry. And uh, you know, the term money ball has become synonymous uh, with this idea in, in industries way beyond baseball. Um, but that was 20 years ago, right? So where are we at now? Uh, after Moneyball, we started to get really uh, uh, increased measurements about what was happening on the play of field. So uh, in 06, we really started to um, um, get widespread availability for uh, how, how fast the ball spins, the velocity, uh, how it moves as it's being pitched. Uh, but really the breakthrough was in 2015 uh, when StatCast came on the scene and they really pulled in uh, all sorts of other stuff, using a combination of, of radar, kind of old school radar, and high definition video to capture everything on the field. And, um, so that started to measure, uh, uh, you know, how, how people move on the field, how fast they're running, you know, that was an entirely new thing. Um, and also, you know, coming into the 20s, we started to get skeletal and biometric data using markerless motion capture. You've probably seen in like, uh, I don't know, Avatar, where they're making it and they got all the balls uh, in their green suit, you know, uh, and that's how they, they capture their, their body. But we use markerless motion capture, so uh, the pitchers, the players, they don't need to wear anything on their body in order for us to capture that. Um, and, and we're getting more and more uh, this year uh, and last year, they're rolling out weather data, which I'll talk about, um, and uh, all sorts of other crazy stuff. 
And so they, they do this with uh, about a dozen cameras all around the field. Uh, I promise you they're there. If you go to a, a game, you look up, you'll find them. Uh, the big black one behind home plate is, uh, is a very common one that you'll see. And so I, I want to take a look at a few examples of these. With that arm speed, it's Corey Seager now. Seager with 26 home runs. Again with his 271 batting average. 3-2 pitch, and that ball's blasted. Where will it end up? It is gone! Wow! That was way the heck up there. Number 27 for Corey Seager. Corey sitting on a fastball 3-2 count, and he just covers this ball from Luis Ortiz for his eighth home. What, what this shows is on-demand tracking and, uh, and delivering of these statistics, right? The, the exit velocity there, how fast he's hitting the ball, as, how fast it leaves his bat, uh, and the projected distance that it's going to travel. Uh, we're also capturing things like uh, exit vol uh, angle, uh, it leaves the bat. Um, and all of these are, are gathered and served immediately, and it's, you can see how important it's become to the game itself when, when MLB serves this right back to uh, uh, the, the people viewing the game on the TV. Um, but it's not just that. I mean, as soon as Corey Seager rounds those bases and gets in the dugout, he wants to see that information uh, on a pad that he has in, his, uh, in the dugout. And this is, good, this is a good time to point out there's a little distinction between what MLB gets uh, and what, what they give to us. Um, we're, we're not allowed to actually serve any live information to the players and coaches in the dugout. And uh, this is because of a, a, a fairly notorious uh, incident involving uh, sign stealing. Uh, signs, there's a, a relationship between the catcher and the pitcher where the catcher would like flash signs to say, hey, throw a fastball or a curveball or something like this, right? Well, uh, there was a team who used uh, you know, trash cans and video to, to steal those signs and, and kind of gain in what was deemed an unfair advantage over, over the team. So we actually, um, we can't communicate with them in the dugout, but we can send stuff to the, the locker room and actually print stuff out and slip things under the door. Um, which is where we're at. And this is, it's this kind of cat and mouse game with the league and, uh, and ourselves. Uh, this is a, another little example here. To right field, Springer back. He's got it! What a catch by Springer! He can start in right field. But he keeps so what you're seeing here is higher level statistics, squad. right? Um, day, by tracking the where the, the defensive person is standing, the, the velocity of the ball, the angle of the ball, uh, their reaction time, uh, we can run this through live models to get the probability of actually making this catch. And so these are, again, data-driven decisions that affect uh, decisions on the field. Uh, we, we tell those people where to stand. We tell those players where to stand to give them uh, to improve, their, I mean, these guys have incredible natural talent, and we try to give them every edge to use that talent to make plays like that, right? Um, and so, and then this can also go into uh, contract negotiations and all sorts of stuff uh, beyond just what happens on the field. So, uh, any of you have played, played sports? Anything like that. Um, you know, in baseball, I remember in Little League, my coach would always tell me, you know, open your hips, like, you know, straighten your back, get your elbow up, and now we can measure exactly, uh, you know, measure head, shoulders, knees, and toes. Uh, we can measure exactly how much they need to open up their knees, their hips, raise their elbow. Uh, but we can also start to use this to find other unique metrics that are available. Uh, the players, have such an incredibly high reaction time. I don't, I don't know if any of you have experienced a 100 mile an hour pitch flying at you, um, but I've got no chance of even like comprehending this thing coming at me. But uh, professional baseball players, they're watching every, like how the pitcher holds the ball to see what kind of pitch they're getting. And so what, what that's showing is every millisecond that they can uh, see the ball less, can give the pitcher an edge, right? Um, 
And again, this, uh, this game of cat and mouse, just try to improve uh, in any small way in order to gain an advantage. It's 3D, so let's go to the uh, first home run by Wilson Contreras. The uh, red arc is what actually occurred. Uh, we get weather data from inside every field. This makes a big difference for us. In Texas, we have, um, it's typically a closed roof, so we don't get a lot of wind. Um, you go to play in Chicago or something like that where there's a lot of wind, it makes a really big difference on the, play, the state of play. And so we want to define what is chance and what is uh, actual skill, right? And if we can say to a player, hey, I know, the, like we can actually see that the wind kept that ball from being a home run, but you had an incredible hit, keep doing that. Um, it makes a, a big difference to be able to, to parse that out. And this just tickles me. Uh, the state of aerodynamics and baseball, NASA's doing studies, uh, just to say that we, we're getting information and absorbing things from uh, just a complete explosion of sources, right? Um, it is really big data baseball. And it's a global phenomenon. There's, there's really active leagues all across the world uh, that we're, we're watching and we're paying attention to. And um, you know, the, the big, other big point here is that it's not just professional baseball. Uh, a lot of our job is finding new talent. And so you know, these technologies are getting cheaper. And so they're being implemented in lower leagues and the minor levels and also like even as low as high schools. There are apps now for, for little league games where parents are like putting in information and things like that. Don't worry, we're not collecting uh, that kind of thing, but. So we started rebuilding our, our data ecosystem. Um, this is an example of our previous uh, processes, uh, just one uh, lineage of one of our end products, our primary end products, and it's a, a big hot mess, right? and it had a lot of problems with it. It was really brittle. Uh, the, the compute and the storage were tied together, so it was, it was really expensive. Um, there was a lot of hits and misses with our scheduling. Uh, sometimes we'd get you know, more, more data on any given day, and the next job would kick off anyways, and we'd be missing all sorts of stuff. And in the end, uh, it's hard to troubleshoot where all these pieces are, fall are, are falling apart, and it's tough to explain. Uh, we have a, a really close relationship with the players and the coaches, worked a long time to develop trust, right? Uh, trust is everything in this business, really. Uh, if, if your end user, whoever it is, doesn't trust what you're, what you're saying, then you're, you're kind of out of a job. Um, but we knew, we knew there was a better way forward. Um, these players, uh, the coaches, everybody, they're incredibly involved. Don't ever get the picture that these are like just a bunch of jocks or something like that, um, mindlessly swinging a bat. Uh, they are deep in the data. Uh, we have embedded analysts with the team, and it's a constant, ongoing conversation with them. And they want more data. They want it faster. Uh, you know, people coming up in colleges, um, they they're they're born and raised on a data-driven game. Um, and we get trades like we had uh, Max Scherzer came from the Mets last year, and he came over and he's, he had a list of reports that he wanted, and he wanted them fast. Um, and in addition to that, uh, baseball is kind of a, a marathon situation uh, where you're playing you know, uh, an incredible amount of games. You're playing five games a week, six games a week, and so you finish your game and you want to uh, study what happened that game. When you wake up the next morning, it's in the past. You want to focus on the next game. Um, in addition to that, uh, within our own department, uh, we have fairly fragmented um, roles. We've got our advanced scouting and amateur analytics, our pro analytics, uh, sports science and player development. Because of the skeletal data we're getting, uh, we've created new biomechanist positions within, um, within our team who, uh, who study just the skeletal data and work with players to improve their mechanics. Um, 
and we wanted to really have a, a more give and take relationship with, uh, with our entire department. Uh, before, it was very fragmented, and uh, I mean, we had people running random jobs on their laptops, and um, uh, I mean, nobody used Git. It was wild, it was wild. Uh, and so, one of the first decisions that we made, one of our best decisions, was to make Airflow the backbone of our complete uh, data ecosystem. Uh, Airflow handles all of our ingestion now, uh, whether it's uh, API calls, FTP, uh, random s scraping of, uh, of um, fan-driven blogs and, and statistics. Uh, and so we, we use that to, to gather all, all of our data, uh, move it through our Databricks Lake ecosystem and transform it, and then serve it out uh, to our uh, data science and machine learning endpoints and processes, uh, our uh, enterprise reporting, business intelligence, and all our reports, and all of our, uh, our game day analysis, draft, scouting, and player development analysis end to end. Um, and we did that because, uh, you know, we really, uh, don't try to read this, this is just an example. Uh, fun to add to, uh, a nice uh, contrast to what you saw before, right? Um, we, we wanted a lot more visibility into what was going on uh, and granular control over our processes. Uh, we, we wanted better scheduling, as I spoke about before, and uh, we really believe in, in the open source uh, mentality. As I mentioned, we, we believe that's been a long part of baseball, and we wanted to continue that tradition. Um, so in order to get more visibility, we just to talk about some of uh, the stuff that we really love. Uh, custom monitoring, you know, using those callbacks, uh, we can get a much better uh, look at what's going right, what's going wrong. Uh, when we click off Databricks jobs, what you don't see over there, we can get you know, Databricks logs right in our, uh, uh, right in our Slack channel. Uh, our troubleshooting time has gone, uh, just gotten, the process has gotten so much easier, uh, as well as getting broader looks at, at what's happening within our ecosystem. Um, uh, we're a huge fan of, uh, you know, we're of huge proponents of upgrading as soon as possible. There's so many people doing uh, amazing work on this product and releasing new features. Uh, this was a pretty fun one. Uh, dynamic tasks, name dynamic tasks. We were on that as soon as it came out. Um, we we uh, uh, pull, there's any number of games that happen across the world at any time, and so whether it's 10 or whether it's you know, 600, we wanna be able to, to capture all of those and have some sort of granular control over what's going on in there. Uh, name dynamic tasks, you know, being able to actually just see what game was played, not to have to say, okay, task 40 failed everybody, let's go hunt that down. Um, we, uh, we really tried to get a little too granular uh, the way that our, our API calls work is we actually do call it on a pitch-by-pitch -pitch basis, and so there, it, it is further nested here, and we tried to get granular control over the pitch-by-pitch, -pitch, and we destroyed dynamic tasks and the Airflow AI, or UI, excuse me. Um, it, it was not, not how it's intended to be used, which is, but as, you know, when you're in the research and depart, uh, development department, um, Data-driven data, data -driven, uh, conditional data set dependencies, uh, an absolute uh, godsend for us. Uh, again, we, we started using this right away to be able to load in, um, you know, whatever in and out dependencies we want from the get-go. Uh, I don't know if you can read that, but uh, when I was doing the run through, you might see Chipotle up there. Uh, we, we name a lot of our processes after Tex-Mex uh, foods, so. You, <laughs> We got some good carne asada going on, and um, we, we enhanced uh, data sets a little bit. To, we added some conditional, sort of a, a branching uh, uh, dependencies so that we could um, get a little bit more fine-tuned control. Um, 
but, but again, and then the addition again of, uh, of not just data sets, but being able to do uh, and ors and, and other conditions um, really, really makes all the difference for us. And, um, you know, because of this, like, there's, a, there's a time where, okay, we saw our process failed with our dynamic tasks. Um, uh, and we went and hunted down, okay, why is this failing? Why don't we have this data? And we start hunting down. And uh, there was apparently a fire at the stadium and um, completely destroyed their server room. So uh, there was no recovering that. Um, but uh, we found out about it a little bit quicker than, than the rest. And so again, in contrast, um, you know, building a, a collection of DAGs into, into this data set, data set pipeline, uh, everything is, is much more um, compartmentalized. We're able to, to troubleshoot and, and make changes um, much more simply. And uh, I gotta tell you, I'm pumped about Airflow 3 where if I can have anything to say about it, we're gonna be one of the first people on that. Um, super excited about the talk tomorrow. Um, find out more about Airflow 3, I'm uh, really excited. Uh, of course, open source. Uh, we, we had an issue uh, early on, so I just wanted to call out, uh, you know, Hank, Elid, um, Yarek, and Pankaj. I'm, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your names or anything, but, um, you know, we've got a team of two data engineers, and uh, uh, it's really incredible to be able to open an issue, and, uh, you know, the community is, is amazing about uh, attacking these things. And, um, yeah, I wanted to call out uh, these guys in particular. If I could give them rings, I sure would. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just, uh, you know, again, this is, we're, we're pretty young on our airflow journey, but um, you know, uh, through this, that we've been really inspired, and we have a goal. We want to contribute as well, um, and uh, definitely have a goal going forward of of contributing to Airflow three and and onwards. Um, and of course, Airflow plays so nicely with with everybody. Uh, we have some really great partners, and uh, want to call them out as well. Um, and uh, just an absolute uh, amazing that, that Airflow can, can pretty much plug and play with just about anybody. Um, but I, as I said, we are a small team, uh, so we were really happy to uh, have Air, uh, Astronomer manage our environment. And uh, just to call out some, some stuff around this, um, uh, being able to kind of right size our workers and, and build worker queues on the fly depending on whatever our job might be, uh, has saved us uh, a lot of time and money. Um, so we're not, we're not expending extra uh, where we don't need to. And uh, if we need some really beefy machines to carry out some big stuff, we can really target those. Um, being able to, to drive into some of the advanced analytics around, around how all of those are operating has helped us catch uh, more than one problem over and over again. Um, uh, but, I mean, the, the process, as I mentioned, Git was a thing of the past, or nobody had, was really using Git uh, when we came on board and before we started rebuilding this ecosystem. And so the, the CICD process with Astronomer uh, is, is really incredible to work with. Uh, you got the Astro CLI. Uh, which is, you don't need to be an astronomer, customer or anything to use the Astro CLI. Been able to, being able to develop locally with that and um, push that into development and automatically deploy, run tests to make sure the, that we haven't made some weird mistakes in there before we push to prod um, is really incredible. But it, this does bring up a, a little problem I do with, have with, uh, with Astro. Uh, is their name Astro. I don't know, our main competitors are named the Astros. Uh, the cheating scandal I referenced before, it was them. <laughs> Whenever you're ready for that rebrand, I'm, I'm right on board with you, y'all. Um, Airflow 3 is a great opportunity, is all I'm saying, okay? Let's talk. Uh, 
And of course, when those deployments do go wrong, uh, Astronomer just lets you roll it right on back uh, with, without a sweat. So uh, when, I, when I make a, a silly little mistake and I've got, you know, coaches banging on my door, we've got a game today, and it's like, you know, it's really nice to have a push button rollback. Um, so putting it all together, we won a dang World Series. Um, I, I want to call out this, uh, this quote from, from my boss, Ryan Murray. Uh, if, you can't make, if you can make yourself half a percent better, then that's a win. And it can really be the difference between making the playoffs and not making the playoffs. And uh, we've definitely been able to make ourselves more than just uh, half a percent better by using Airflow and Astronomer. Um, some examples of our kind of modern day uh, where these analytics have gotten us. Uh, the launch angle revolution happened not so long ago. If you hit at that ball at a certain angle above 60 miles an hour, you're just way more likely to get a hit. You see that little, it's just a pretty graph too. I, I love this thing. You see that little blob up there. That's, uh, if you hit it anywhere at that angle uh, above 100 miles an hour, those are home runs. Um, so we're, we're able to deliver uh, reports to our players and to our coaches uh, and more timely than ever. Um, if, you, uh, if you ever watch a, a game, uh, you might see the players, they'll be looking in their hats. They're not just daydreaming, uh, we print out cards for them um, that they look at. So if they see a batter's up and they're like, okay, well now I gotta go stand over here, right, uh, to get that defensive positioning. We also print out uh, the catchers will wear um, a card on their uh, wrist that they'll look at to determine pitch sequencing and strategy against, against players. Uh, you know, the Rangers had never won a World Series. Uh, up until last year, they were the oldest sports franchise in the country to have never won their uh, respective um, title, so it was very emotional for, for them and amazing to see the community. Um, it's uh, really a team through and through, so uh, really an amazing experience, and uh, that's all I got for you. Thanks so much for, for hearing me out. <laughs> <laughs>